Well, let's get the COVID-19 update out of the way, and because we're all thinking about it. Um, it just so happens, of course, in God's sovereignty, it's no surprise to him that this is going on. And two, it was no surprise to him that several months ago, we as elders had planned a planning retreat yesterday. So we had set aside four hours for some strategic work, and it turns out we needed to use some of that time to talk about COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Um, we took quite a bit of time to pray and to look through some scenarios and to plan for worst-case scenarios and short-term, middle-term, and long-term implications of this new stage of reality. A first for me and a first for all of us, I think, uh, being in a pandemic. So, number one, please pray. Please pray for us as your elders and two, for anyone affected by this awful virus. Two, please walk by faith and not in fear. Walk by faith and not in fear, which means keeping an eye on, uh, and I guess an eye is a bad way to look at it, but keeping, keeping a register of what's going through your brain unchecked, right? All those thoughts that are going through there unfiltered, bring them to the gospel. Bring them to the gospel and remind yourself of the hope that you have. If you or a loved one is sick, please be considerate of others. There's no shame in staying at home and huddling up and making sure that nobody else gets sick. If you are high risk because of pre-existing health conditions, age, or other circumstances, there is no shame in staying at home and waiting until the storm passes. There's none at all, okay? Let's be in prayer for each other that we can walk by faith and in wisdom in this difficult time. Let's also be praying that we can be the feet and the hands of Jesus during this time. We've already seen the panic and the rush for toilet paper, which there has been no end of memes on that subject alone. I saw several funny ones yesterday. Um, but fear begets fear, doesn't it? And never underestimate what fear can do in a large crowd. And there's whole dissertations written on that phenomenon alone. The implications may be that we have elderly or those who are sick who are unable to get the resources they need. If you know of someone, would you be willing to help them? If a neighbor or coworker is in a bad way, would you be willing to step up? I hope so. I hope each of us would think more of others than ourselves in this time. In fact, the church shines the most brightly in the darkest of circumstances. So history tells us. Our staff office will remain open um, at this point until further notice, 8 to 3. There'll be somebody in the office, so that's a central point. Feel free to call or email. If you are not getting our email updates or our prayer uh, updates, then please fill out a communication card and share your email with us and let us know that you want to be added to those things. We cannot share with you unless you give us permission to and a means to do so. So I've had some emails come in, hey, Pastor, I'm not getting some of this email, and odds are it's uh, perhaps you just forgot to fill this out and let us know your new email or check your, um, your spam box. Sometimes big group texts get labeled spam and stuck away and you don't see them. So fill this out, fold it in half, and uh, we'll be having a retiring offering today only. You can put that in the offering plate, okay? And we'll make sure, and Esther will make sure to update those. Uh, the governor just had a, uh, a, a live update here at 10 o'clock. Many of us are aware school will be canceled starting as of Wednesday, and then through not that Friday, but the following. So it's been our policy for now a couple years that when school is canceled, all Wednesday activities are as well. So that means youth group is off for the next two weeks at least, or we hope to meet again April 1st. Again, Awana youth group Wednesday activities are going to be postponed until further notice. As for our uh, being open next Sunday, we're still praying about that. So would you help us pray through that issue? Okay, would you help us by praying for us, so we'd have wisdom to know whether it's best to close the doors and do a remote sermon or a live video or whether it's best to keep meeting, okay? 
we would really, really appreciate that. Um, I think I've covered all the basics. Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Stand with us, please. This is page 651 in your pew Bible. We'll be reading from Romans chapter 6 and then from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is on neighboring page 662. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through through 29. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other... Oops, that's John. Ha, ah, not Romans. Silly me. There we go. It's all good, right? It's all good. There we go. What shall we say then? There we go. See? It's my accountability. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord, this is page 662 in your pew Bibles, For what I received from the Lord, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and, we had given, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And God bless the reading of the word. Let us remain standing and pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us in Matthew's Gospel, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Saints have been praying that prayer for over 2,000 years. Saints have been praying that prayer for over 2,000 years. And today I'm reminded, and just as a brief side note, of just how meaningful the Lord's table is and baptism. For two, these have been signs and seals of the church since the beginning. Well, we're in a sermon series called This We Believe, which is walking through our statement of faith as an Evangelical Free Church of America and the Evangelical Free Church here of Thief River Falls. We are on the body, or that is the church, doctrine of the church. Last week, we walked through what is the church and why membership is assumed in the New Testament. Because the church is a body, a new community. No one is meant to live out this faith on their own. There are no John Waynes mentioned in the scriptures in that sense. And today, we're going to unpack the ordinances of the church. That is, the two commanded things that we are to do continually. One is baptism, and the other is the Lord's Supper. And as I've said, the church historically has been practicing these since the beginning. So when we practice these things, I not always, but often think that saints in so many different tribes and tongues and languages have been taking the bread and the cup in war and in times of peace for fear of persecution in public meeting and gatherings like this in languages that I cannot understand, but yet you and I would know the meaning 
of what they were praying. For it is a very tangible reminder, the Lord's Supper and baptism, of our unity within the great diversity of the body. These are mighty symbols, and the symbol that came to my mind to kind of help us illustrate this is the wedding ring. Many of us wear a wedding ring, and I actually tried to get mine off this morning, and that was painful, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I didn't put any lotion on, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, your knuckles swell and it gets stuck. We look at a wedding ring, and we see a very powerful and very tangible, tactile symbol representing an event where my wife and I made a commitment before God, and many of you made that same commitment before God in front of friends and family. This ring marks me, a married man. This ring marks you, sisters, married women. The, this ring marks a commitment that we My wife and I have made, and you spouses have made, and that you've made to God as well, and that you trust he will help you keep. This ring encourages me and us in sad times, and it steals my resolve in the harder times. I can still remember a friend of mine in seminary, newly married, maybe a year, skinny guy like myself, not real big hands, He was walking around the lake at the seminary and he went like this and his ring went flying off in the lake and he dove in and he couldn't find it and he was just devastated. Why? Because this ring, like so many symbols in our lives, has a lot of meaning behind it, doesn't it? It can even be convicting and something we want to no longer touch or see because of circumstances in our lives that this reminds us of. Symbols have a power. But they don't have the power to really do anything. Of course, this symbol didn't marry my wife and I. This symbol doesn't save or preserve our marriage. This symbol doesn't magically do anything. It's not like the One Ring and the Lord of the Rings or other fantasy novels. There's no inherent power in this ring. It's a symbol that represents something. And as such, It only has that power that we give to it. The Lord's Supper and baptism or ordinances, they are symbols that Jesus has given his bride. And here's our main point today, if you're note takers. Jesus has given his bride, the church, two ordinances that are his gifts of confirmation and nourishment. Write that down if you're a note taker. Confirmation and nourishment for a reborn people. And those are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Again, Jesus has given his bride, the church, two ordinances that are gifts of confirmation and nourishment for a reborn people. And those are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Our doctrinal statement, thank you for pulling that up, Jason. Our doctrinal statement reads as follows. We believe that the true church comprises all who have been justified by God's grace through faith alone and Christ alone. They are united by the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ, of which he is the head. And here's our section today. <clears throat> the, lo- the true church is manifest in local churches whose membership should be composed only of believers. Sorry, here it is. The Lord mandated two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, which visibly and tangibly express the gospel. Though they are not the means of salvation when celebrated by the church in genuine faith, these ordinances confirm and nourish the believer. That is Article 7 of our Statement of Faith. Baptism is what we're going to begin with. Baptism marks the entrance in and serves as a reminder of what Christ has done and is doing and will do. Particularly, baptism recognizes a believer's profession alongside the church's affirmation of the promise of salvation. So there's going to be three sub-points to baptism, friends. Profession, affirmation, and the promise. We here at the Free Church practice believers' baptism or credo baptism, but as you noticed in our Free Church statement, it does not narrow us to that only. Thus, in our membership interviews, we do allow members who have been baptized as infants and feel that that has held and their consciences are firm, that we allow that to stand. Okay, the Free Church has often been noted for majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors. 
and we have felt that this is not an issue of division. But as your elders, we do believe we see the most evidence in the scriptures for credo baptism or believer's baptism. That is someone who makes a choice to be baptized and is not baptized as an infant. So today, when I speak of baptism, that is what I'm speaking of today, credo baptism or believer's baptism. And again, it is a believer's profession alongside the church's affirmation of the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. The New Testament doesn't separate repentance and faith from obedience to the waters of baptism. We see it consistently in Acts, though Acts, granted, has some strange circumstances. Matthew 28, 19, if you know your Bibles well, this is the Great Commission. And if you wish to turn there with me, Matthew 28, 19 simply reads this that Jesus gives to his disciples and to us in this day and age. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." Last week, we walked through Acts chapter 2 in Peter's first sermon, and we saw that they were cut to the heart, and they cried out to him, what must we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. And that day, 3,000 souls were added. So in the New Testament, and I could give more examples, but in the New Testament, a believer in baptism, it's synonymous. To think of them as being separate doesn't make sense in the New Testament. And two, baptism is a public profession that you and I cannot do by ourselves. We need someone to baptize us, right? You can't baptize yourself. Your shower doesn't count, or your bath. It's a public profession there, and what an encouragement it is. As you know, we're planning, and this is obviously uh, held loosely now with our pandemic that we're in, but we're planning on a baptism service the Sunday after Easter. And I can tell you, if if we're able to accomplish that, it is such an encouragement to the persons being baptized and to the whole congregation to hear their testimony and to know that these men and women or children are being baptized into Christ as an act of obedience and a symbol of their response to the gospel and what the gospel has accomplished in their lives. Romans chapter 6. Turn back there if you haven't. Uh, left it. That's fine. Romans chapter 6. We're going to walk through this passage in a little more detail today because it is a helpful application and how baptism is used in the New Testament. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, which he has not met yet but desires to meet, writes this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound, Paul says, and by no means, exclamation point. In the Greek, very strong language. Why? How can we who have died to sin still live in it, Paul says. And then notice his illustration. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul goes to the visual symbol that they've all seen publicly displayed, whether it was their baptism or the others. Paul looks to the baptism and says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. And we were buried, therefore, with him under the waters by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. So just as we are baptized under the water and we die, we are raised with Christ as we come out of that water. And Paul points to that powerful symbol to say, how, having been baptized, can you and I continue in sin? How can we continue in sin? We've died to ourselves. We've died to a life of sin. We've identified ourselves with Christ. He unpacks that there and further in Romans. We don't have time for that today. It would be a great sermon. And we have been raised with Christ. Friends, Baptism reminds us that our faith isn't an add-on. It isn't something we stick in our, you know, our arsenal of faith. It is our faith. It represents our faith. It summarizes the gospel. It does not save us. The waters of baptism do not, but it symbolizes all that we believe the gospel to be true, that we needed 
a Savior to die for us, that we're under wrath, and that we need the waters that Jesus commanded us to go under as a remembrance of what he has done for us by faith through his grace and only in Christ. So baptism is not only a profession of our faith, it is what we profess as a new Christian. It comes alongside the church's affirmation because it's a public event. It's a public affirmation. Now in Acts, there are some instantaneous baptisms, right? Peter sees the Spirit break out, and it is a miraculous work in Acts chapter 2. This is confirmation of faith, and they are baptized there that day. And there are several more examples of this in Acts, but not all of Acts has instantaneous baptisms. And we find if we look in the church, starting with the Didache, which is a document of discipleship in AD 90, give or take, that the elders of the young churches began to realize we need to have a, uh, an interview to ascertain, really, are these men and women truly wanting to follow Christ? And thus, we here at the church, just like churches for thousands of years, have an interview process. So I hope you are considering baptism if you have made a profession of faith or if you have not been baptized. And I can't wait, or Kent or one of the elders, to meet with you and to just affirm and confirm, yeah, we believe you are in Christ indeed. Because here's the danger. If we mandate instantaneous baptism, we may run the risk of giving people a false sense of security. It's a similar issue with infant baptism at times. It's a similar issue at times with infant baptism. We begin to look at the symbol and not the faith. We begin to look at the visual act and not the heart. So thus, we practice an interview so that there is an assurance that any who are baptized are truly followers of Christ. <clears throat> and since it's a requirement for membership, that too is incredibly important. It is incredibly important. So we have not only a profession of faith in baptism and the church's affirmation of that faith in baptism, but now we come to the nourishment part. We come to that part that is the promise of our salvation and how baptism becomes a symbol we look and can look back on and remember and be reminded of the promises. Galatians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles and you're able to turn there, turn there with me. Go eat popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you're looking in your Bibles and you don't have a quick savvy for where Galatians is. Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 through 29. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 through 29. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For many, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then he expands that. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And that is the promise of the old covenant now made into the new covenant. So we have a, we have a declaration of our faith, we have an, an, an affirmation of it by the church, and then we have this amazing confirmation that baptism can serve in our own hearts. It confirms that promise of the salvation that we have in Jesus. We've been baptized into Christ. We have put on Christ. And over the centuries, it is what can be the most powerful witness for the Christian faith is our unity, especially in hard times. Just watch, if you haven't already noticed, especially on social media, hard times bring division, don't they? Hard times bring harsh words and name-calling, cat-calling, rushes to go do things. It's all about me. And we begin to serve ourselves very quickly when we're under pressure, when the stress hits. But watch the church, and I hope and pray, and your elders and I, we pray that this is true for us, that we show our faith in Christ, that we are one in Christ, and we think of each other more than we think of ourselves. And we think of our neighbors more than we think of ourselves. What a powerful witness, friends. For one of us, none of us, let me back up, none of us walk perfectly. We all have our, 
our hardships, our struggles, but all of us in unity doing something, that shows the power of the gospel. And that shows a witness that cannot be dismissed just because one person, eh, maybe they didn't say the nicest thing to me. But all of us working together, that's power. We are one in Christ, our baptism reminds us. We all have shared the waters and have come up to a new life in Christ. <clears throat> First Peter 3, verses 18 through 22, reminds us that baptism is also a sign of our adoption into the family of God, and it reminds us that we now see Christ as the King of our lives and over all the universe. So I'm mindful of the old Campus Crusade for Christ track that talks about who's on the throne of your life. You or Christ. And baptism is a visual reminder that we have died to our throne. We have been risen in Christ and he reigns and we reign in him. In Acts, which is a, a tough book to read. I'd love to have you read it over this break, especially break from school kids. You want a good challenge? Read through the book of Acts. The hard part in Acts is, is to know what is descriptive and what is prescriptive. Let me back up. In a genre like narrative, we have to ask ourselves, is that just describing something or is it telling us you must do it this way? Okay? Does that make sense? So is it descriptive, just describing the events that happened or is it telling us this is how it should go? In Acts, often <clears throat> we find division because we mistake the description for prescription. And we cling to one verse or example where God is doing something utterly unique in Acts, and we make that an ism, an ideology, and we create something out of it. Why do I say this? Because I want to clarify one issue that times comes up when we talk about baptism, and that is, Pastor Kevin, are there two baptisms? Is there a baptism in water and a baptism in the Spirit? Are they two separate events? Some would argue from a passage or two in Acts, oh yes, that's the case. But I would say again, hard cases make bad law, or in Acts, those cases are descriptive rather than prescriptive. Furthermore, throughout the letters of the New Testament, where Paul is teaching these churches that were converted in Acts, he reminds them, and he reminds us, that no, Paul talks of one baptism. One baptism, not two. So at times we talk about a baptism in the Holy Spirit, and I'll be real brief, but here at the Free Church and under our statement of faith, this is not something we advocate. And I would say, strongly as a pastor, it's not something I would say is scriptural. Here's the danger. Here's the danger of having two baptisms, one in water and one in the Spirit. It creates a varsity and a junior varsity Christian. Unintentionally, I think, but it creates a varsity and a junior varsity Christian. The junior varsity Christian is the person who's been baptized in water and has made a profession of faith and they're members of the church in good standing, but they're not quite the varsity Christian because he or she has been baptized in the Spirit. They've got the real deal. It's an unintentional implication, but it happens, and I've seen it in fellowship, and I've seen the arrogance that it can breed. I could say more, and if you have questions, write me a note, and I'd love to talk with you about it personally. But again, I don't see the evidence in the Scriptures holistic teaching of the New Testament that to say that we should expect two baptisms. We receive the Spirit upon salvation, absolutely, but it does not require a second baptism. It is descriptive and acts in some of those rare occasions where the Spirit comes first. It is not necessarily prescriptive. Moving on, <clears throat> and by way of summary, baptism, friends, is a wonderful gift, a wonderful symbol, and I look here, by the way, this is our baptistry, if you didn't know that. I'm not looking at those flowers. They're pretty, but there's a, there's a baptismal under here. And I look forward to, hopefully, in uh, four weeks or whatever, baptizing several brothers and sisters here. So baptism is one of the powerful symbols that Jesus has said, practice this. It is the visual entry into the church, into the new community of Christians who are following Jesus. Two, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a present reminder of what Christ has accomplished and what Jesus will consummate in the new heavens and the new earth. If you're a note taker, write that down. The Lord's Supper is a present reminder of what Christ has accomplished in the past and what he will consummate in the new heavens and the new earth at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Of course, this is originally 
based off the Passover meal. So when we read in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John that Jesus gathered his disciples for what we call now the Last Supper, it was a Passover meal. It was a Seder meal. It was a celebration and an obedience to Exodus chapter 12, where Moses tells his fellow Israelites, God is going to come through and kill the firstborn of every family here in Egypt and the animals as well, unless you sacrifice a pure lamb and put its blood above your doorpost. The Paschal lamb, the sacrificial lamb, it's terminology we've used. There's the roots, Exodus chapter 12. And so the Israelites obey, and they are awoken, many of them in the night or in the morning with the wailing of the Egyptians, as every Egyptian household up to the Pharaoh lost their firstborn. John chapter 6, which we read, the worship team read, Jesus continues with Exodus and calls himself the true manna from heaven. So the Jews are, are free, they come out, but they are in 40 years of wandering in the desert, and they receive their sustenance, their bread from heaven, from God, the manna. Jesus takes that a step further in John 6, 51 through 59. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus uses these symbols of bread and wine as his blood and his, his body and his flesh. The Jews, of course, disputed this. Verse 52, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus explains it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You're dead. Whoever, verse 54, feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Matthew chapter 26 and Luke 22 show us then Jesus sharing this last Passover meal with his disciples. The hour came, they reclined at the table, and the apostles with him, and Jesus says to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I supper. And as we read in 1 Corinthians, he takes the cup, distributes the bread and the wine, and reminds them that this his body is given for them in remembrance, and the cup is poured out for them. The Lord's Supper is our regular reminder of what Christ has done for all who believe in him. It is our regular reminder that his body was broken and his blood was shed. A gruesome, a gruesome sacrifice to save us from the Father's wrath. It is a wonderful and powerful and commanded ordinance. It is a gift. It is a mercy. Now, we could unpack these in uh, more time. I'm just going to quickly go through them. We do not hold the Roman Catholic view that Jesus' body actually becomes this bread and this wine, that there is some type of transformation. We don't hold that view. Jesus is not re-sacrificed every time the body and the blood are taken the bread and the cup, excuse me. We don't hold to the Lutheran view that it is there in a mysterious way. We may hold more of a Reformed view, some of us, that is to say that Jesus is not here physically, but he is spiritually blessing us through the body and the blood, through the wine and the cup and the, and the bread. Or we may just see it as a symbol, a very powerful symbol, a very powerful symbol that has a real gift for us, that is, the encouragement, the nourishment. Again, we're not going the Roman Catholic route or the Lutheran route here as an evangelical free church, but I personally do think there are times where I experience just a goodness of the Lord that I, I wouldn't experience otherwise. There's something powerful about touching and tasting. We believe in the power of the preaching of the word, but there is a power. It's not magical. This isn't hocus-pocus but it is certainly within God's means to use bread and, well, grape juice to bless us as we remember what it means. Again, it doesn't have power in itself, just like my ring doesn't, but through faith by grace, at times these symbols can be incredibly powerful for us. If you can, turn with 1 Corinthians real quick, and we're going to walk into our, our time of taking the Lord's Cup together. 
Paul <clears throat> warned us in chapter 11, verses 27 and following. And at times we forget to read this when we take the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis. So let me read this and just wholeheartedly recommend. Verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself or herself then and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. Friends, we believe you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus to take the cup and to take the bread. If right now you are not sure if you think Jesus is the Savior in your life and the world, if you're not sure where you stand, let the cup pass. Let the bread pass. Take time to pray. Take this warning seriously. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. He later goes on in verse 30, which is not up there. That is why so many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be contemned along with the world. So friends, be discerning. If there's a, an issue between you and a sister or a brother here that is not resolved, consider letting the cup and the bread pass and taking time to pray about how you might resolve that. Okay? Again, make sure, make sure you know Jesus personally. And two, make sure there's no outstanding sin between you and a sister or a brother. Because of our concerns for our health and our safety, we are really taking the Lord's Supper in a different manner today, and I'll walk through that quickly here in a little bit. But just by way of reminder, Jesus has given his bride, the church, two ordinances that are gifts of confirmation and nourishment for a reborn people. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. So let me encourage you. If you've made a profession of faith, if you believe Jesus' blood covers your sin, and you have repented and cried out to him, but you have not been baptized, write that down on your card. Let us know. We'd love to meet with you and love to celebrate with you. And the church would love to affirm your faith and welcome you in. And two, if you're not sure where you're at, there's no shame in letting the, letting the cup or the bread pass. You will do yourself a better by letting it be so.